Right, well, today we're going to have a look at a, a, a few medieval parish churches in the Brightwater area. These are Acliffe, Bishop Middleham, Darlington, Fort Mister, Highington and Sedgefield. Um, now, overall, uh, a bit of background on churches, because churches are really important. There's around 8,000 medieval churches in England, almost all of them founded before around 1000 AD. Virtually always the parish church is the oldest building in a parish. In County Durham, there are around 70 intact medieval churches and others rebuilt on medieval sites. And there are six in our study area. And here they are, uh, Acliffe, Bishop Middleham, um, the quite spectacular Darlington, Hawthorne, Liskern, Highington and Sedgefield. And we're going to visit each of these just in alphabetical order and look at a few of the interesting things about them. But first of all, just a, a bit of basic stuff that you probably know, the naming of parts. Here is a typical parish church. The main body of the building is called the nave. That's from a Latin word for a ship. That's where the congregations sit. And uh, that's often extended, widened by aisles. So there's a nave of the south aisle. Most churches have a tower at the west end, big ones sometimes have a tower in the centre. Uh, this has got a west tower. The chancel is where the altar is and where the priest and choir do their stuff. That's all invariably at the east end of the nave. Chancel might have aisles, but a lot less commonly. A few other things you can see on here. Low side window, we'll come to those. Those are interesting little windows, low in the side wall, in the south wall of the chancel at its west end. And uh, a priest's door, that's a separate door. Let's uh, say so the chancel is really the domain of the priest and he has his own doorway usually. So there is a typical parish church. And typically churches grow, they evolve over the centuries. And again, this is just a, a, a general example. Starting off late 11th, 12th century with a little single cell rectangle, then a chancel gets added. Uh, the 13th century was a great century for chancels. Church ritual developed and they needed more space and maybe a porch gets added. And then uh, a bit later on, the whole thing gets enlarged transepts, which are cross, sort of a transverse arm at the east end of the nave. They get added as well here and the western tower. Then aisles added, the nave is widened to get more space in the 14th century in this example. And then by the end of the medieval period, they've added aisles to the chancel as well. And the whole building becomes quite a broad rectangle, full length aisles and transepts. That's a typical form of churches in quite prosperous areas like East Anglia and West Yorkshire, less so in areas like County Durham. And dating a building, well, I'm not going to give you a, a talk on architecture, but some basic things. The form of the arch is very basic. Round or semicircular arches are classic sort of Saxon, but more commonly 12th century Norman work. And here's an absolute stunner from Kirkpeck in Herefordshire. And then with the Gothic, about 1200, this pointed or two-centered arch comes in. Then late in the medieval period, getting towards Tudor, the four-centered arch, you can see, um, Playing with a compass, you can produce these different forms, and that's shown on the drawings. OG arch and a double curve is typically the 14th century. Segmental arches are later. A Tudor arch is sort of a flattened four centered arch. Segmental pointed comes as a general medieval form. So you've got to be careful, but it's a, a general guide to date. And then arcades, when the nave is widened to form arcade to form uh, and to add aisles. The aisles open under arcades. So you've got a, an undivided space apart from these pillars, which you always, when you're in church, you always end up sitting behind a pillar. Uh, here's a 12th century arcade drawn, and there it cuts through a Saxon window. People get puzzled seeing remains of windows and of arches. But what they did, they built the arcade into the wall so when they went to enlarge a church, they didn't knock the walls down. Oh no, you kept your roof and everything in situ. 
and you simply cut a chase in the wall and built the arch and its pillars into the wall, only when you'd finished and those pillars and arches were holding up the wall, did you then knock out the masonry underneath, which is why the majority of surviving Saxon fabric in this country doesn't touch the ground. It's above later arcades. That one also shows the door to the rood loft, which is a beam across the chance carrying a big crucifix to the rood and a corbel to carry it as well. And often the capitals of the arcades were an opportunity for some carving and display. And here is um, a beautiful example, 13th century from Sedgefield, showing a, a pair of birds sharing a single head. Rather nice. There's some quite good, sort of grotesque and inventive sculpture on these capitals. Evidence is outside the church. I mentioned the low side window. Here it is again, set low in the wall at the west end of the chancel. Uh, antiquaries love to debate the function of these. Were they for giving lepers communion? Was the squint to look inside? Well, not really. The best bet is it's where they had a lamp at night to dispel the evil spirits from the churchyard. There also you can see in that drawing, the original church had a nave without aisles and its cornerstones or angle coins uh, are visible. And one of the giveaways for a Saxon church is to have great big meaty coins, often termed megalithic or monolithic. And they come in various forms on these sketches here, the side alternate, and then long and short of uprights and flat stones. Again, uh, other things on the drawing, you can see the aisles being heightened, you can see its original roof line, that's a quite a common feature. And then you know, windows get replaced, and you can often see traces of the earlier ones. And on a south facing buttress, there's often a little scratched sundial, a mass style, so you can work out the times they ought to be in church. A plinth, I always find plinths are really interesting. That's the courses at the base of a wall. Uh, and very often when they built a church, there was an offset course, often chamfer just above the ground. Uh, here's an example. Um, the one on the right is based on Osmotherly in the North Riding. And there you can see the medieval plinth at the bottom, probably 12th century. Then the wall above has been rebuilt. And there's a square top plinth, which is typical of the 18th century. Then above that, the tool and margin masonry shows there's a 19th century rebuilding. So in that little bit of walling, you can see evidence for 12th, 18th and 19th century work. So plinths are all worth looking for. The uh, breaks in the plinth show original door positions, things like that. Anyway, uh, Brightwater churches. We're going to start off with St. Andrew is at Acliffe. You're built right on the magnesium limestone. You can see from the colour of the church, it's creamy grey. It's built largely of limestone rubble from local quarries. Uh, it's a, a church with an aisled nave, classic design, an aisled nave, western tower, and a, a chancel. And the western tower, the belfry, the top stage, is a later addition. You can see it there with quite a big window with wide tracery. If you look closely and with the eye of faith, you need to believe me. Uh, the little window underneath that is set in the blocking of an earlier 12th century belfry opening. So the tower's been heightened. All sorts of things have happened to it. Most of the windows, as you see them now, are Victorian. Some restore the original form. It's a church that's been a bit, I wouldn't say over restored, but quite a lot of restoration. And here's a plan, and it's quite complex, because when you get inside, and this is what I enjoy looking at this, and it's a good fabric to read. There's evidence of two phases of Saxon nave, and then the aisles have been added. So you can see there what's happened. The first, which not really enough to date the Saxon work, there's only little bits of masonry left above the arches of the arcade. But you can see where the first West End was, uh, could be yeah, eighth or ninth century. Then it's been extended west. Then the tower, has been added, pro probably early, maybe early Norman, could be late Saxon, we're not quite sure, but it's been altered so much. Then in the 12th century, the chancel was enlarged, the North Isle was added, so the arcades there, uh, and then the chancel was um, extended. That's quite common of the later 12th and 13th centuries, the development of church ritual, they wanted a longer chancel to you know, do more in. So the chancel is late Norman, 12th century. 
Then in the 13th century, they add the South Isle. Uh, or when they add any, they add the South Isle, a lot of it gets rebuilt in the, probably in the 14th century. Then uh, various phases, you've got three phases here, 1835, 1852, and 1882, a Victorian restoration, and the whole North Isle gets rebuilt. So it has been knocked around quite a bit, but it's a, a good building. Here on the left, we've got a couple of Saxon crosses. Very often, the main evidence surviving of a Saxon building is detached bits of sculpture. And here's a very nice Saxon cross shaft. It's lost its obsession with a, a crucifixion, then three saints above. And then you can just see the beginning of some nice entwined beasts with interlace. On the right, there's the North Arcade. That's late 12th century. And you can see just this side of it, a straight joint. Again, straight joints are important. And that is the northwest corner of the first Saxon nave, which was then extended west. And there are further angle coins a bit further west, marking the extension. Uh, also, the church has some um, very nice medieval grave slabs. In the chancel floor is a very nice slab of, um, it's been, well, uh, a, a blacksmith and his wife. There's two slabs. Well, it's all one slab with two crosses on. The right hand one has a sword emblem for a man and a pair of pliers um, and a hammer emblem for a smith. The left hand cross has the female emblems, a pair of shears and a key. Those are the things a medieval housewife would have worn on her girdle. What is virtually unique about this slab is the little consecration crosses. It's been reused as an altar slab, which seems quite odd, a gravestone to be recycled um, as an altar. It's been originally tapered, it's been cut square. It's been recycled as an, an altar slab, um, which is odd. The other slab uh, on the photograph is a 14th century priest slab. It's got some very nice, it's carved in relief. And it's got some very nice stylized foliage oak leaves and acorns, oak leaf, pomelade cliff, well, just maybe. And the emblems are a book of the Bible on the right of the shaft, and the chalice on the left. And they both have birds perched on them, which again is unusual and interesting. Um, I mean, the bird of paradise is seen as an emblem of eternal life, but these look a bit more like starlings, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? An interesting slab. We'll have our second church, Bishop Middleham. Now, Bishop Middleham, as the name implies, was a special possession of the Bishop of Durham. And he had a castle of what had Manor House there. And he's also probably responsible for the parish church being a bit bigger and a bit grander than usual, although not quite on the scale of Darlington. Dedicated to St. Michael. And uh, again, you're on right on the Magdalene limestone, and you can see from the gray color, this is a limestone church. And this is the one of our churches that doesn't have a tower. It has a rather nice bell coat instead. The bishop really moved on in the later medieval period to his favorite residence, which was Bishop Auckland. So maybe this church didn't get much later medieval extension. Um, it's mostly 12th and 13th century. Here's a plan. As you can see, the, the west end of the nave and a fairly short chancel and Ireland's nave then were mid 12th century. There's various evidence of the fabric. Then in the early 13th, it receives aisles and the chancel is as usual in the 13th century extended. The North Isle gets rebuilt in 1747, that's the green. And then the Victorians give it a new East End and a new vestry in the 1840s and some new windows. So it's had a very standard development. Inside, there you are, you've got very nice, what they call early English style, uh, early Gothic arcades and chancel arch. Uh, so the Lancet windows in the East End are uh, right for the period, but they're actually Victorian restoration. Here's a medieval grave slab with some, about a dozen of them, uh, reset by Victorians in the walls of the porch. It was a nice font that, uh, decorated for Christmas here. You see what the font's made of. It's this spotty, um, frostily marble. It's uh, actually it's a, a black limestone we call marble, technically not marble to a geologist. Uh, and it is uh, has loads of fossil corals, um, dibunofilum 
Bipartium, if you're a paleontologist going through it. It's a, it's a very, very nice ornamental stone used to great effect in many Durham Cathedral and other churches, more or less across the country. It was Durham's speciality. Anyway, coming to Darlington and our grandest church, um, a part on Saxon foundations, we think that the building we see today, which is a cruciform, cross shaped church, largely built by Bishop Le Puise, we used to call him Pubsy, but now we call him Le Puise in the late, uh, the late 12th century. Um, as one of the great bishops of Durham who did a lot of building. And it's a very, very grand church uh, with this tall spire and so in the center of power. And uh, old Darlington had quite a few interesting buildings which have sadly been lost now. On that, there's a bit of an 1826 town there. You can see the church, a cross shaped church in the churchyard. And then to the south, a labor B, the poor house, was actually the bishop's manor house or bishop's palace. It had a gatehouse um, where Freedom's House D stands. Uh, there was a medieval tithe barn at sea, which went a long time ago. Then the medieval deanery facing off the marketplace. Now, excavations in the marketplace 20 years or so ago revealed uh, an, a cemetery which was centered on, they didn't find that. They thought another church to the west. So there was a, uh, there was possibly earlier or maybe there were a pair of Saxon churches, but there was a separate cemetery, separate to the St. Cuthbert Cemetery, but adjacent to it and the marketplace. So you had at one stage, two churches and two cemeteries side by side, which there's obviously some interesting historical reasons behind that. Inside the church, impressive interior. Again, lots of good 13th century features. Um, there is a stone rude loft here, which is unusual under the chancel arch on which the organ now sits. Um, there are some Saxon evidences as of Aycliffe, some loose stones, but I don't think we have any Saxon fabric in the standing building, except the west end of the nave is unusually thick and it may be refaced and that part of the Saxon west end or Saxon power there. Something funny is going on. And I suspect an earlier building incorporated, but you can't really see anything of it. And there are lots and lots of exciting things in here. The stalls in the chancel have these misericords, which are these little seats that tilt up. So you could sort of semi-sit on them when you're supposed to be standing, or put them down and sit down properly. And underneath the 15th century carvers have enjoyed themselves. So there's some very nice faces and foliage and beasts. Again, just good quality stuff here. Uh, with the front cover in the foreground, which itself is spectacular carving, the, the wall of the south transept, and these carved discs, technical term is patterai, P A T E R A E, in the spandrels of the arches. You can see the arches have typical early English dog tooth ornament. Sorry, it's nail head, I always confuse the two, nail head with flowers carved at the hoodmore terminals, and in the spandrels between the arches, these very, very nice circular discs you know, obviously the carvers enjoyed themselves it's a good quality building mostly within a decade or so of 1200 and the British manor house sadly gone its foundations were looked at briefly in about 10 15 years ago uh, what they actually dug mainly were the foundations of the poor house which replaced it um, in the early 1800s and a lot of reused stones were found, um, which I drew. And they were take, uh, there was a plan to build them into a structure on the site, which sadly never happened. And they, they were taken to a yard near Ferry Hill, and goodness knows what happened to them, sad. But it's nice putting this place back together on paper. And you can see it was a superb medieval building with a, um, a chapel at the east end with Norman windows. It was a 12th century building. and. Um, very, very picturesque old building. A couple of doorways from it uh, have been taken and re-erected in a garden in Middleton, St. George. So it was enlarged in 1808 to make this workhouse. But, and the building finally survived until, eight, sadly, should have been saved, 1870, quite late. So that's a loss, but it's an interesting building to speculate about. Right, moving not very far, about 
two miles to the northeast in the suburbs of Darlington, Hawthorne Le Skern, actually on the banks of the Skern, a St Andrew's church there. Um, nice little church, a simple little church, nave, chancel and west tower with the growing population in the late 19th century. It was enlarged and they enlarged it by adding, uh, not adding aisles, but adding transepts. So it spared the western part of the nave. And looking at this picture, you can see the transept in the middle. And you can see the stone is sort of quite irregular courses, sort of looks, looks antique, but that's Victorian. And when they build like that, when the courses are continuous, it's called snecked, S-N-E-C-K-E-D, snecked stone. And you can see on the right of the transept, the angle coins of the earlier nave, which could be late Saxon, more likely early Norman, 1100-ish. The next picture shows the chancel in more detail. Yeah, and there you can see there was a short chancel about 1100, uh, which was extended in better squared stone, maybe about 1180, 1200, you know, this era when they were into extending chancels. So the actual um, division, it's not easy to see, it comes about where that headstone is, just under the second window. Um, there's been a big, there was a big post medieval window. So the Victorians, have replicated the, uh, one of the, the normal windows. So the central one there, convincing that it looks, is a Victorian one. And then there is a later medieval low side window, a two light 14th century window with OG arches. And, um, and then a clasping buttress to the late 12th century East End. So that's a wall that tells a story. And I like walls that tell stories. And here's a plan. You can see the very plain nave, quite thin walls, which is a different way to Saxon work, really, of 1100-ish, and similar masonry in the original square box-like chancel. Then late 12th century, 1175, the um, chancel is extended. 13th century, the tower is added, although they take the original west door and recycle it in the west wall of the new tower. Um, the low side window is the only later medieval thing. Uh, then uh, 1894 to 5 is the main works. That's when the transepts and porch and vestry are added. And here's some more pictures. And quite interesting, the contrast between what the church looked like, uh, sort of pre-Victorian, and then after a sort of thoroughgoing Victorian restoration on the right. And you can see to improve the acoustics, they put in a whole big new Gothic arch above the chancel arch. Thankfully, they were obviously trying to keep what they could. There's two big new arches into the new transepts. They have kept, in this case, all the pews, which are a very, very good selection of early 17th century pews, and the pulpit and reading desk, they in a matching pair, again, at the same date. So it's got very good fittings. And, um, and there's a message of book published on the church with lots of drawings before the restoration. And you can see there it had a Western gallery the Victorians almost, this is the drawing on the lower left. The Victorians almost always did away with these galleries. It had a Western gallery. And um, then the, the wainscoting and everything all around is 17th century. Moving on, um, Praying Tom, sorry about the spelling there, I realized. St. Michael's Church. St. Michael's churches are often on hills. It is said, dangerous statement, that the St. Michael's Church is often replaced temp temples dedicated to Mercury, and Michael and Mercury are both winged messengers. So it's on a hill about five, six miles north of Darlington. It's quite a big hill. You can actually, on a clear day, and I have seen this, you can see York Minster on the horizon, 50 odd miles away. Another church the Victorians got at, you can see on the left there, pre-restoration uh, drawing and then below more or less the same view now. Um, it's quite interesting. The pre-restoration drawing uh, shows three Norman style windows in the East End, and that was a big Gothic window. But the, when you check, they weren't Norman. They were an early Victorian restoration. And then later Victorians decided they weren't quite right and put in a big Gothic window instead. The tower is however genuine Norman work, and it's really quite spectacular. Again, tremendous view when you get on top of it. But 
there. It's a good building. Here's the plan. You can see a mid 12th century nave and chancel. Then uh, a bit later on, not long afterwards, the chancel is extended further. The extension has thicker walls. Interesting, might have been vaulted. Um, the tower is also an addition, uh, you know, late 12th century or mid 12th century. Uh, the south, on the south, there was a chapel added in the 13th century. Uh, and then that became the east end of an aisle when there were further extensions in the 14th century. Then uh, two phases of Victorian restoration, 1840, various new windows, 1875, they needed more space. They added a brand new North Isle and rebuilt and extended the vestry. Here's things to see there. Splendid Norman chance arch, very, very nice. South Arcade, uh, 13th century, 13th and 14th century, North Arcade, uh, late Victorian, although copying the South Arcade. So the east window is Victorian. The pulpit you can see there is actually late medieval. It's really rather nice. Um, on the windowsill in the South Isle, there is this stone. Uh, it's called a crescent stone. It was used, it would be laid horizontally and wax would be put in the various compartments and wicks. So it'd be like a, a multi-wick candle, a crescent stone. And the south door is a nice 12th century piece, but, uh, but it's actually in the wall of the 14th century aisle. Very often when they added an aisle, they took the earlier doorway and reset it in the new aisle. Not quite sure why they did this. Obviously the doorway was seen as important. It was an important place. It's where transactions were carried out. Marriages were you know, held actually at the church door. I think it Chaucer's wife of Bath, it's, it, it refers to as husbands, husbands at the church door, she had five. So uh, doorways were moved around. Quite a lot of the Norman doors we have today have actually been moved when the churches were enlarged. It's, it's a nice doorway with this um, chevron, very typical 12th century ornament. Right, Sedgefield Church, St. Edmund the Bishop. That is a grand church. Uh, quite a complex story. Um, big Western Tower you can see for miles. And uh, it's full of very, very good um, 17th century furnishings done, uh, made under Bishop Cousin, who was a bishop, of a high church bishop in the 1600s, who was very fond of his church ornaments. Um, the, it's probably the best 17th century church interior in the county. Bransford was better, but Bransford was sadly destroyed by fire in 1998. But he, here's Sedgefield, and it's a cruciform church, although unlike St. Cuthbert's Darlington, it's got the, um, the tower, this grand tower, 15th century, at the West End. And the, uh, a lot of it is 13th century. Um, chancel and the transepts, uh, well, it, yes, the chancel is early 13th, then we have the nave, and then the transept's a bit later still, I think. Um, not sure the way around. Looking look at my plan, the colors are a bit close to that. <laughs> but uh, a good building. Um, and lots of interesting features. I mean, I, I've stared hard and long at this. The chancel, it was rendered until about 20, 25 years ago. And so it's never been looked at the walls when they were stripped. They show all sorts of interesting features. And I have a suspicion that the eastern part of the chancel was built as a separate chapel, although I'm not sure that needs more research. Here we are. You see, the chancel is full of blocked features. There's a priest's door wall up and a lancet window above, then the remains of another lancet window to the left. It's one of those pieces of vertical archaeology that you really need to, well, get a good rectified photograph of or um, you record, you do sort of scanning these days and record in great detail. You need to do some detailed recording so you get to know it because so much has gone on and then you begin to understand it. And that really still needs doing. I, I've stood and stared and scratched my head, but it needs to be looked at properly. Even in that photograph, 
you can see so much. I mean, I can see at least three block windows in there, as well as a priest store. And um, and the way the string core steps up at the buttress, you know, you stare at a wall and you think and you ask why. Very often, in my case, I get home and sketch things and look at my photographs and I keep on asking why. And I go back and ask, ask the question again. And I don't always come up with a, a comprehensive answer. Sedgefield Chancel needs another look. And there you've already seen this. This is the very nice arcade factor with the two-headed bird. So that, that is St. Edmund the Bishop Sedgefield. And to conclude with a couple of slides, a mystery. Um, lots of buildings have mysteries, and I enjoy that. You know, when you read the fabric, you never get all the answers. This is a church you might know, a place called Leek. It's on the edge of an Orfield Moors, right beside the A19, about 20 miles south of Middlesbrough. As you drive down towards York, it's on the left, right by the road. Has a very nice Norman tower. And I want you to look closely at this. There's very typical 12th century masonry below the belfry, good big squared stones. And you can see low down in the middle, a Saxon crosshead that's been just built into the wall at some stage. It's an appropriate thing to do. But above it, look above it, about a meter above it, there is a big diagonally set feature. It looks for all as if somebody has carved um, a, a sort of you know, one sail of a windmill on the fabric. And then, and then it's suddenly cut off so that the upper part of the, that walling must be a later rebuild. But there's this great big incised feature which has been truncated by presuming the 12th century, by the rebuilding of the, the Belfry. What is it? I mean, my guess is some elaborate form of sundial, or I'm not sure. I've seen nothing else like this anywhere in the country. It's one of these things you spot. The, the time to be there is when there's oblique lighting. Uh, when, as I use the phrase, when the sun comes around the corner. And I remember uh, going to this church at you know, 11 o'clock in the morning and waiting for the the sun to move until the lighting was just right where you can see this odd feature. It, again, it needs recording and drawing properly. Um, another mystery. And some things you just don't explain. And there may be reasons that the builders made a mistake. So I want to finish with a, a rather nice cartoon by a friend of mine. 